great initiation of Jesus. Jesus' visitation with Mary and disciples for 40 days after resurrection. Memoirs of Beloved Mary, Mother of Jesus, heretofore unchronicled. An address by Beloved Mary, Mother of Jesus, February 5th, 1954. I have thought it would be a pleasurable gift to life this year to endeavor to record some of the heretofore unchronicled experiences of our life in Judea. From time to time, as opportunity permits, I shall bring to your remembrance certain of these homely pictures and scenes. Prior to the great initiation of our blessed Jesus, we used to sit together in comparative privacy in those few moments we sometimes had when there were no demands for assistance from the public. We talked about the ways and means by which we could best perpetuate the truth, preserve the clarity of Jesus' message, and give it to posterity as a workable law. During the years of my son's life, I dedicated myself almost entirely to the holding of that immaculate God concept for him. I did not engage in any extraneous services except those required of my household. I endeavored to live in a state of constant contemplation of his divine manhood, emphasizing his mastery through the pressure of my own concentrated thought and feeling. After the Blessed Joseph was removed from the screen of life, I felt a double responsibility in the holding of this immaculate concept. I can tell you sincerely that it was not without much personal regret that I parted from the great strength, the great serenity and dignity of Joseph to walk that path more or less alone. However, the law of life and the lords of karma determined it to be so, and when his mission was accomplished, he, like all the others before him, folded his robes about him, and returned into the heart of the Father. It was my opportunity to remain. Sometimes Jesus and I would sit together in the evening and talk over the various points that were to be emphasized through his ministry. More than once we discussed the necessity of passing through the appearance of death in order to prove the immortality of life, and that man through his own consciousness might transcend death and master a garment which to all intents and appearances had lost its vitality. In the retreat where this initiation takes place, for instance at Luxor, it is comparatively easy for the highly trained initiate to withdraw the senses from contact with the world about him and suspend the breath so that to all intents and purposes the body is dead. However, to perform this act consciously amid hundreds of vicious and uncontrolled consciousnesses is an initiation of a different sort. Yet the outer consciousness is such that unless mankind themselves actually performed and executed the death sentence, they would never have believed that the resurrection was authentic and that it was not the trick of a faker or a manifestation of hypnosis. I will tell you frankly, neither Jesus nor myself relished the necessity of having him pass through this great service to life. When he did ask that the cup be taken from him, it was because none ascended or unascended knew for a certainty that victory would be assured through a public demonstration. You see, through such a demonstration, all of the astral and psychic viciousness that had accumulated since the fall of man was directed through those embodied individuals who allowed themselves to be used as pawns of that force. They acted it out on the screen of life, endeavoring to destroy the serenity and equanimity of the initiate. Not only the pitiful masses who opened themselves to those forces, but the far more subtle and powerful influences that wished to destroy the victory of that mission were something with which to be reckoned. From the time that the first so-called miracle at Cana placed Jesus' name before the people, through the days of Golgotha, 
I made what you would call today, in the terms of the church, a perpetual novena. I spent hours, every available moment that I was not attending to the necessities to keep our bodies alive, in contemplation and in prayer for the fulfillment of the victory of the resurrection through him. Luke, one of the disciples, was a physician and had been privately initiated by Jesus in some of the subtle activities connected with healing. Yet he would often say, I do not believe it can be done. However, as you know, it was done beautifully with the assistance of the great Maha Chohan and the beloved friends ascended and otherwise. The memory and the glory of that experience remains to this day. I speak of this only because you might wonder why we did not plan more for the future. Our minds and hearts were more or less concentrated on making this mission so dynamically and positively impressed upon and embedded in the consciousness of the people that somehow we didn't think too far beyond the resurrection morning. Those of you who were close by in those years know that the mission of Jesus was deeply recorded in the etheric bodies which you carry. Also, the victories and the miracles recorded in writing the books of the Bible, which have been a pattern for the people up to the present day. These records are to be revivified now and brought forth as a positive proof of his truths and his great cosmic service to life. However, as we drew closer to that final pageant, Jesus and I decided between us that I should return to Bethany. You see, in Bethany, we knew almost the only happiness during those difficult days. We knew home there. We knew the sweetness of the flowers and the joy of friendship that was untouched by desire for personal gain. We used to sit there and just rejoice in the presence of God and of each other. Jesus said, Mother, in Bethany, I think you and those who will remain can best live out those years yet allotted you. If the law permits, I shall visit you there from time to time, and to the best of my ability convey to you and those of my heart friends the laws which will strengthen and assist you to help the people. So, on that day at Calvary, when the hours of trial were accomplished, John and I walked down that hill. Remembering our blessed Jesus' admonition, John took me back to Bethany, and the other disciples joined us there shortly after Easter morning. There we had the exquisite association with each other in the forty days before the ascension, which time was given us by the karmic board as a grant of mercy. If the disciples and the heart-sore believers had been denied that association of the mystical presence of Jesus for those 40 days, I think they could not have held the faith. The resurrection morn was a very small instant. It could have been, the human mind would say, conjured up out of hope. But for 40 long days, we had a visitation every day. Sometimes we had just minutes, sometimes an hour with our beloved, and so the Ascension Day was not as difficult a parting as was Good Friday. The story of our stay in Bethany and how we devised the plan to set the Christian era into action, I am going to endeavor to draw forth for you as quickly as time will permit and your energies allow me the freedom to enter your worlds. It is a pleasant recital, a happy and peaceful one. It is about a time when Jesus did come, oh yes, very often, and talked with us. A time when we recorded many truths. A time when Peter, James, and John wrote Gospels that remain hidden to this day. They will one day come forth as the mystical and inner teachings of the Christ. My story is also about a time when healings were manifested, oh, in a simple and unostentatious way, perhaps, a time when those who loved my son chose to embody his teachings in learning the intricacies of mystical healing. 
At that time, I also wrote certain treatises for posterity, which I hope to bring to your attention at a later date. This was a time when ages yet unborn were unfolded before us, from the free heart and spirit of the one we called master and friend. Bethany will always hold a place in my heart and the hearts of all who were part of it there. This morning, I have come primarily to bring you peace, beloved ones, to confirm the Ascended Master's faith in your light, to confirm the trust and belief of the Brotherhood in your spiritual integrity, and to tell you, each one, that you are precious beyond words in the sight of God. This may seem of very little import to human senses, but the registration of the outer thoughts and feelings of the people is no measure for that which is God-confirmed. Beloved children, it is a beautiful thing to look at hearts you fashioned 30, 40, 50 years ago and see them so little changed. In many cases, to see the crystal light having raised the vibratory action of every cell. It is a beautiful thing when one gives a lovely piece of handiwork to any of God's children and finds it sustained in grace, often burnished by the light and fire of suffering until it is a more beautiful chalice. One day when you lay these bodies down and carry the replica of that heart into the halls of karma, it will be lovely to see it with the light shining through containing within it the harvest of your service in all your embodiments. I, for one, am looking forward to that day with great joy. Thank you, and God bless you.